This series is all about universes, multiverses, planets, worlds, continents and cities. We're delving not into specific games, but into the milieus created for them. We'll be looking at where these settings came from, their major features and why you should consider them for your own gaming experiences. Episode 7 beckons, and with it, the planet Calthea, the sixth planet, not including asteroid belts, orbiting a star that will become known as Serral, possessing of five moons, one of which being the home of superhuman beings the populace know as gods. This is the Shadow World, a campaign setting associated with Iron Crown Enterprises role-playing games, Rollmaster, Fantasy Hero, Harp, and, to a lesser extent, Space Master. The Rollmaster game, as we have discussed in previous videos, was born from a Dungeons & Dragons campaign set in Tolkien's Middle-earth. It was originally released as a series of formulated house rules, intended to replace various parts of existing games. From 1980 to 1982, along with its rulebooks, Arms Law, Spell Law, Character Law and Campaign Law, a generic setting and adventure was released, The Iron Wind. This was the start of what would become Shadow World. The Iron Wind detailed an island cluster known as the Mur Fostisir, with its cartographer being Peter Fenlon, and Fenlon sharing authorship with Terry K. Amthor. It is of no surprise that even though 1984's expanded edition of the work only clocks in at 56 pages, the detail packed in is immense. We are introduced to the world itself, with some planetary details, and the nearby continent of Jamin. Through this, a sense is built that this group of islands is part of something weighty and extensive. With the Cloud Lords of Tanara and Vogmur coming in 1984, Vogmur having previously been released with campaign law, with the second edition, The Iron Wind, the Lawmaster series was, well, both started and finished. The Shade of the Sinking Plain was among those releases, but was done in partnership between Iron Crown and North Pole Publications. Although this latter work has the initial trappings of the rest of the Lawmaster series, it omits a number of things that would make it, for want of a better term, a true Lawmaster product. Chiefly, indicators that it belongs to the Lawmaster series and the cover, although it does state as much inside, and a tangible location within Calthea. It was later discarded when, in 1989, the Lawmaster series was reformulated into Shadow World. And that came with a flurry of products. Most important of these was the Shadow World Master Atlas, which provided an overview of the world, its inhabitants and game editions for Rollmaster and Fantasy Hero. The Atlas stated four goals. To provide a background setting with enough material to enable a Game Master to set up a detailed campaign with minimal preparation, to present game material for this world for Rollmaster and Fantasy Hero, initially, to provide enough conversion notes to make the setting usable with other game systems, and to present the setting of Kulthea in such a way as to enable Games Masters to integrate it, in part or in whole, with his or her own campaign setting material. Generally speaking, it succeeded on three of those four points. As to the last, I'm not so sure it does. Within the Master Atlas, everything to the makeup of the solar system, to the planets within it, to the specifics of Calthea in general, provides so much detail that integrating it in part or in whole with another setting is, well, I won't say impossible, but I will say it's likely not worth the effort. That's not to, me, to detract from Shadow World as a setting. That's more to say, if you're going to use Shadow World, then use Shadow World, and proceed with caution if you're going to try and glue it to anything else. As we will note, though, the convenience presented by the various blockages to long-distance travel, and the presence of various fantastical means of travel, do aid in the use of the adventures, at least, being fairly easy to integrate into a non-Shadow World setting. But the detail warning does still apply. Although as a footnote to this particular caution, it should be noted that both the Iron Wind and Vogmur were not originally part of Shadow World, and references to nearby continental masses could well be taken, although not explicitly stated, as pointing to Middle Earth. Linguistically, at least, both enclosed, standalone, isolated island settings do sound Middle Earthy. 
Compared to most of the worlds discussed in this series, the number of publications covering Kulthea is relatively small, around 20 or so combined adventure and source books, plus more detailed volumes for the central continents of Jamin and Emma. However, don't let this fool you. If you are at all familiar with Iron Crown's campaign output, be it for Shadow World or for Middle-earth during their tenure as holders of that particular role-playing licence, you will be well aware of the detail that they are capable of. Part of this lies within the broad format they use. Source first, game statistics summarised and tabularised in annex form, and liberal use of detailed maps. Part of the detail also comes from the Rollmaster rules themselves. Regardless of the fantasy hero and harp options that are tucked into Shadow World books, it is clear that Rollmaster is its intended rule set, and the space given over to extensions of that game, particularly within the Master Atlas volumes, Rollmaster is a detailed game, with several formats having been developed to enable a lot of that detail to be represented in shorthand. The Shadow World supplements make good use of these shorthand formats, and, through them, we gain a lot of information on flora, fauna, climate and so on that other game formats require much more space to deliver. This equally applies to the source books and adventures, the latter which also follow the MERP pattern, which is to present the setting at hand and then to provide one or more adventure scenarios for that setting. As for Shadow World itself, it is a mixture of science fiction and fantasy. The science is highlighted within the setting via the language used to describe it, particularly within the Master Atlas volumes. Right from the start, we are introduced to Kulthea as a planet, unusual already for a fantasy setting, complete with its physical characteristics, composition of the solar system, of which it is a part, and notes on orbital periods and radii for each of the 15 orbits of the central G-type star, including six gas giants and an asteroid belt. With respect to the fantasy element, the usual and not-so-usual monsters and species are extant, as well as magic. Here, though, magic has a scientific explanation, sort of. The flows of essence, a form of radiation generated largely by the planet's flora and fauna, the concept of magic is the ability to manipulate these flows to produce certain effects. Spells, if you will. These flows affect the weather, form obstacles to travel, travel between different regions of Kulthea is difficult, we'll touch on that in a bit, and otherwise form a real and presence force, if not considered for daily life, certainly considered for one's existence. The three core magical principles of the Rollmaster game are tied back to the flows of essence, giving uh, the entire span of magic a pseudoscientific root. Essence users manipulate Essence directly. This would be what Dungeons & Dragons eventually named Arcane. Channeling users gain their magical power from powerful beings, gods, if you will, who in turn supplement their own magical fuel by drawing on Essence. This is the equivalent of D&D's divine magic. Mentalism is the ability to channel Essence through themselves. The nearest D&D equivalency would be the charisma-based casting of sorcerers, say. Kulthea itself comprises a number of landmasses that are isolated from one another by geographic and supernatural barriers. This makes long-distance travel a virtual impossibility, except for those who are trained in circumnavigating such obstacles and barriers, chiefly the navigators, who we will touch on in a bit. To summarise a little here, though, long-distance travel is generally only possible through the guidance of a navigator, and navigators can be contacted through black obelisks that are constructed across the world. Generally, the populace of an area has no contact with the populace of another area. Mundane navigation is just too difficult. As a game aid for referees, this provides a mechanic for channeling a campaign in specific directions. If you don't want the characters to go into a particular region, the barriers to get there are too difficult to navigate through, and the price demanded by a navigator is too high. On the other hand, if you want to run an adventure that takes place on the other side of the world, then a navigator may well be found who can teleport the entire group of characters to where you need them to be for a reasonable price. Portals similarly exist, and can be used as a plot device to allow characters to travel freely from one place to another, or to enable adversaries to travel to the character's locale, or whatever is needed. 
These portals can also link to other worlds, moons and dimensions. The sky and beyond is the limit. Alongside navigators and portals, Shadow World presents the concept of Isles of Transfer. These are islands which cross boundaries of time and or dimensions. Again, plot devices that can be used for a multitude of purposes. For gods, Shadow World takes a rather different route than many fantasy worlds, but is not unknown within science fiction, where the concept of gods with real power are present and explained. Here, the gods are not what we might consider truly divine, but rather super-beings that have, in one way or another, presented themselves to the populace as if they were deities. Prominent amongst these are the Lords of Orhan, the largest of Kulthir's moons. Channelers who draw from these lords are almost always in touch with their chosen deity, as Orhan is omnipresent as a moon, regardless of where one is on the planet below. On the other hand, local powers, gods that live on Kulthir and form cults about themselves, do not have such an omnipresence, and their channelling followers can find themselves reduced in power as the barriers of the world and distance thin out or sever their connection to their god. No specific origin is given for the gods. They are immortal superpowers, and that is really all that needs to be known. But that is not to say that in-game lore for different cultures does sometimes provide a variety of origin tales. The shadow of Shadow World comes from the encroaching presence of unlife, a source of true evil in the world, both the bringer of and feeder on destruction. The unlife is described as a form of negative essence, a sort of anti-energy, and was allowed to bleed into the world as beings learned how to manipulate essence. Using essence upset the balance between the positive essence, powering normal spells, and that formed the barriers keeping in the negative essence of unlife at bay. And so, through that unbalance, unlife came into Kulthir. In order to forward the unconscious goal of unlife, cults and evil beings manipulate it in the form of evil spells and serve to break down the essence barriers even further. Kulthia possesses a number of world-spanning organisations, most of which are loose within the definition of the word. The lawmasters are manipulators of governments, meddlers in the workings of the world and gatherers of information. The Lawmasters are a world-spanning organisation headquartered within an unmapped island group and governed by a council of twelve, six of whom are immortal. The Lawmaster focus was present from the second iteration of Shadow World, with the initial releases published under the banner of the Lawmaster series. The Navigators are the other major global organisation being a coalition of a number of navigator guilds that focus on monopolising transportation services. They are masters at mundane navigation as well as utilisation of the essence flows and essence itself to provide efficient transportation for their clients. There is also an element of control among them, for through their monopoly they can determine who can travel, where and when. The lawmasters and the navigators are important aspects of Kulthir, but there are a few other prominent organisations to briefly consider. The sages of Nomikos are gatherers of knowledge for knowledge's sake and dispense knowledge for a price. The dragon lords are, in fact, dragons, which can, through the use of magical helms, assume human form. There are five of these, and they form an organisation insofar as they have similar goals in heading up cults and promoting the rightful dominance of dragonkind within the world. The sky merchants of Selkai ply the airways with their flying ships, creating a rich mercantile centre out of their capital of Eidolon, the floating city. Finally, the heralds of night are the chief servants of unlife, lending their power and service to those beings and groups of evil natures. Returning back to Kulthir as a science fantasy setting, and once more visiting the science component, Shadow World itself exists within the default setting of the Space Master game, Rollmaster's compatible science fiction sister. Within that setting, it is the Devon system of Serral, the world itself being identified as Serral 7. According to Devonian Directive Kappa 27483 1 Epsilon 2A, planetfall on Serral 7 is restricted. 
a Devonian station is present, which can be seen from Kulthea as a point of light, and those familiar with Brian Aldiss's Heliconia novels may get a kick out of that. It is somewhat interesting to note that within its fantasy context, only the Western Hemisphere is dealt with in any detail. The Eastern Hemisphere is left open, described only in terms of its difficulty to visit and successfully return from. That a Devonian survey would surely have mapped out the entire planet does leave Kulthea a little half done from a science fiction perspective. However, it's still a fun thing to consider, an adventure or campaign of Space Master characters interacting with the inhabitants of Kulthea, or even natives from Kulthea entering into space. The compatibility of Space Master and Rollmaster allows this cross-genre type of thing with little effort. To round out the origins of Shadow World, I will note that some, but not all, of the Shadow World source books and adventures are available from Drive-Thru RPG. Key are the third and fourth editions of the Master Atlas, with game statistics aimed at Rollmaster Fantasy Roleplaying and Rollmaster Standard System for the third edition Master Atlas, and Rollmaster Second Edition, which is currently published as Rollmaster Classic, for the fourth edition Master Atlas. A second edition of the Jamin sourcebook is dual statted for Rollmaster Classic, Rollmaster 2, and Rollmaster Fantasy Roleplaying and Rollmaster Standard System. And a third volume of the series detailing Emma. Uh, again, dual statted, but unfortunately orphaned, since Iron Crown have not re released the first for the Northwest and second for the Northeast volumes to drive through to support it. With the passing of Shadow World's designer and leading light, Terry K. Amthor, in September 2021, it is unlikely that Shadow World will receive anything more than cursory support in the foreseeable future. I've touched on most of the features of Shadow World in the Origins section, perhaps muddying the waters there a bit. However, I will summarise the world's key features here in brief. Shadow World is a science fantasy setting with a fair amount of top-level detail, particularly in describing the planet of Kulthea's Western Hemisphere, within a master atlas of which four editions have been published. The planet and its solar system are also canon within the Imperial setting of the Space Master game. The supernatural, including gods and magic, have tangible explanations that could pass for scientific within the science fantasy context. The world possesses features, including essence barriers, portals, law masters and navigators, that provide game masters a number of tools with which to guide adventures and campaigns. And the setting is very detailed, partially due to the authoring style of its designer and developers, and that's used by Iron Crown in its heyday and partially due to the detailed nature of the Rollmaster game system that it was initially written for. The setting itself, while primarily written for Rollmaster, has compatibility with Harp and Fantasy Hero, and can, admittedly, by discarding or converting much of the game material present in its publications, be used with virtually any set of role-playing rules. For those that are so inclined, conversion notes to Dungeons & Dragons and RuneQuest to name two can be found for Shadow World, and there are fan-made Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition Shadow World materials out there in the wild if you care to hunt hard enough. Those, I feel, are its major features. It is an enjoyable setting, if the setting material can often read a little textbook-like and dry. The presentation of the materials is up to the standard Iron Crown set for themselves with their excellent Middle-earth materials, and there is plenty of room, the entire Eastern Hemisphere aside, for individual game referees to stamp their own creativity for their gaming groups. If you are a Rollmaster referee and do not own a copy of any edition of the Shadow World Master Atlas, then shame on you. I don't say that because if you play Rollmaster you should be playing Shadow World, but because it is a brilliant example of how elements of the game can be constructed into background material. Not only that, but there is also a wealth of game material there that can be used in virtually any campaign. The adventures run from general fantasy to those that tap into the science fantasy backdrop of Kulthea, and those latter are the more interesting of the bunch. They can be made to work with any campaign setting and rule set. As for the source books, the Emma volumes and either edition of Jamin, for example, these are 
not so useful unless you're actually playing within the Shadow World setting. Jamin has the most adventures set on it, Emma has the most source material, and their proximity to each other, regardless of what the navigators might do, make the two continents natural companions. Beyond those two continents, the outlier materials, such as Nomads of the Nine Nations and Journey to Magic Isle and Star Crown Empire, can make fair sojourn off the beaten track for a change in scenery and pace, but otherwise may just add details that you'll rarely, if ever, make use of. If you are a fan of Heliconia, then absolutely, Shadow World is probably the closest thing in the world of role-playing that we have to that world. Obviously, not from the centuries-long seasons and so on, but for Kulthia's integration into a wider universe. A world of fantasy that exists within a science fiction backdrop. It also opens up the question, how many other such worlds could be ported in, under observation by advanced technological societies? Food for thought. Shadow World stands out among the many role-playing worlds, for its consistent detail, coherent explanations of virtually everything, and the integration of essentially referee meta-tools into the world's background material. It's an interesting world that deserves to be more widely known than it currently is. <laughs>